to the responsibility to protect. From atrocity prevention. Word kill. All societies are potentially vulnerable. Atrocity crimes. Timely and appropriate action. Hello, and thank you for tuning into this interview. My name is Jacqueline Streifeld Hall, and I'm the Publications Director at the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. Uh, at the Global Center, over the past year, we have had multiple conversations and public events around what it means to prevent and respond to atrocities at a granular level. Um, these discussions have ranged from addressing the relationship between R2P and human rights violations to situating atrocity prevention within the Women, Peace and Security agenda, to even understanding the preventive and restorative aspects of pursuing investigations, justice, and accountability. To explore these dynamics further, we're planning on having one-on-one -on -one conversations with practitioners from the field of human rights, conflict prevention, atrocity prevention, and other related agendas. We hope that through these conversations, we can explore challenges, identify best practices, and share lessons learned on how we can protect populations more effectively. What can we do individually and through our institutions and governments to invest in prevention and act in a timely manner? In these conversations through both a personal and professional lens, we will understand how practitioners approach human rights protection and atrocity prevention. Um, so we're delighted to have our first conversation today with Ms. Rita Ijak Nindiaye, an expert voice on human rights prevention and atrocity prevention. She currently serves as a rapporteur for the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and was previously the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Rights. We're also pleased that during 2019, she joined the International Advisory Board of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. It's such an honor to have you with us. Thank you for joining us today, Rita. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Hi. Okay, so Rita, um, I think it may help to start with a bit of background on you and what motivated you to work in this field. Uh, your UN bio says that you are inspired by your own experiences of prejudice and discrimination. Can you share with us a bit about your background and identity and how this has helped shape your passions for human rights and what led you on this current career path? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, what I can say is that I was born in a small town in southern Hungary to a mother of Roma origin, or gypsy, as some people know, this uh, ethnic group. And my father was an ethnic Hungarian. So their marriage was one of the very first in Hungary, which was a mixed marriage. And what made it worse is that my mom was an orphanage. She was institutionalized at an age of 11. And so when my father who came from well, a well-established agricultural family and married my mom. It was a big scandal in Hungary. And I should also say that my father is an ethnic Hungarian man from a family who was residing previously in Czechoslovakia. And they were um, transferred to Hungary by the population uh, exchanges. So my mom had a difficult fate because she was Roma. And my father also had a difficult fate because he was Hungarian. So for me, I really embraced both identities and both cultures, and I felt just very comfortable with, with both of them. Um, I didn't really recognize that from an early age, some of the responses I got from the society was actually because of this origin and especially because of my Roma origin, but it became very clear when I was working as a student, um, well, it wasn't really an internship, it was actually a paid job, but at that time with the administration. And I, one day I just didn't get invited anymore to the job. And when I asked um, the administration of this company why, they told me that it was too obvious that I am a Roma girl. And it's too shameful for this company to be represented by a gypsy girl. At that time I was in the law school. I was a third year law student. I spoke German, I spoke English, and it was really a wake up call that in today's world, still what matters is where you come from, who your parents are, and not your merits, not your qualifications, not your own personality, um, your own skills. And so for me, this was the push. It was a very painful experience, but I'm also very grateful because I knew that I have to use my law degree for human rights. And right after this experience, I joined an international Roma rights organization and I became a minority advocate and which I remained in my entire life. 
So I think this is an example of how a bad experience can actually be very inspiring and just lead you to the right path to recognize what you are supposed to do with your life. That's incredible and uh, mm -hmm. such an interesting way to flip a painful experience into um, a really positive career that uh, has touched many people. Um, so right now you're serving as a rapporteur for CERD uh, and previously you were a rapporteur on minority issues um, for the UN from 2011 to 2017. Um, so I have a few sort of questions about, about this work. I think um, one thing that not many of us outside of sort of the UN and UN treaty body world know what CERD does or, or what your work looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how your role contributes to the protection of vulnerable minorities around the world and, and maybe how that differs from uh, the work you did as Special Rapporteur. Yes, thank you. It's true. I don't think that many people who just work on the ground are familiar with the UN system in general. And that's very painful because I think we can be useful. I don't um, dispute that there is a lot of room for, for improvement for the United Nations, but committees like mine can be very relevant. What people usually know about us is that we receive governments and then we review what they are trying to do to fight against racism and racial discrimination. But they, oh, we also do a lot of other things that people don't really know about. And one of them is that we receive early warning and urgent action letters. So if there is a community, and very often these are indigenous peoples who are trying to defend their land uh, lately, um, if there is any violation that a community faces, they can come to us and say, please do something quickly, because we are afraid that we can be evicted, we can be abused, harassed, killed, there are all kinds of unfortunate situations of uh, human rights violations against these groups. And then we try to get in touch as soon as we can with the governments and then try to correspond with them. So they, they know that we are watching them and you know it's that is a monitoring mechanism over their actions. And we also receive individual complaints and communications. And just uh, two weeks ago, um, during our last online session, we decided about a case. Again, it involved indigenous peoples, the Sami from Sweden, and we ruled that their rights were violated when Sweden did not um, respect their right to land. And there was no free, fair, and informed consent um, when uh, consent uh, was given to a company. And so we also do these kind of things, but we, for example, adopted a very important general recommendation on racial profiling, which I recommend everybody to read, because it really goes into what is racial profiling, why does it happen, what are the consequences, how is algorithmic bias, for example, playing a role in it. And so we do quite a, a lot of things. Um, you asked me what is the difference between this role and being a special reporter, and I must be very honest with you. There is a big difference. And the, the fact that I was first a special reporter and now I am a treaty body member, it's even more um, obvious to me. And this is really the power of field visits, which I cannot do as a treaty body member. When you are a special reporter and you visit a country, it's an amazing experience to have the access to information and the access to communities, like I think in almost no other position in the world. If you're an independent human rights expert coming from the United Nations, it's almost everybody who is ready to meet you. So when I went to countries like Iraq, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Cameroon, Brazil, Ukraine, so many, you know, you can meet the prime minister, you can meet the foreign minister one-on-one. -on -one. You can ask all the questions you want. But then you can also meet the speaker of the parliament, you can meet all the ministers, and then you can leave the capital, leave everybody behind, and go to the field, go to the communities, meet school directors, religious leaders, community leaders, activists, young people, women only, IDPs. So you have access to all these people and you see where they live. You see their natural environment you can hear from them firsthand what they feel. And these are people and communities who would never be able to come to Geneva for a treaty body session. So what I miss from the third committee is the actual feel of what these communities go through and what they struggle with, because it's only 
the wealthy, well-established elite civil society organizations that can come to report to us. And this, they are very appreciated because we need their voices. But I just miss going to those people who are really the most vulnerable, who don't speak any languages, who, who really struggle in their everyday lives. Because for me, this is what indicates, you know, where a society fails. And these communities, which are completely neglected, abandoned, sidelined, forgotten, for me, they were the important voices to measure what a country is doing, you know, to really show that everybody belongs and everybody is important. That's a, that's a very incredible comparison. And I, I feel like we've heard um, similar observations from, from others who have had um, kind of these shifting roles within the UN system. I know in the, the piece we published earlier this year by Ivan Simonovich, he had a similar observation about the, the kind of capacity he had to work with vulnerable populations as um, assistant high commissioner versus, uh, or assistant to the high commissioner in New York versus um, when he was special advisor on R2P. So it's sort of refreshing, although a little bit disappointing to hear kind of similar views that like, um, once you're disconnected from the communities, it really impacts your ability to, to sort of see the progress, see where the needs are most. And um, so that's incredible. Um, I guess, since you've been able to interact with communities on the ground, I'm wondering what you've learned about prejudices, biases, discrimination, racism, kind of how minorities are treated and, um, and how that may connect to sort of atrocity risks that we see. Yeah, I think the main observation I have is that there is a false narrative that people just wake up one morning and start hating each other. I have been in communities who had no problem living together 10 years ago, and now they are completely separated from each other based on their religion. And when I read reports and narratives about, you know, we just started having an interreligious tension between the communities, you must know that something is wrong. We don't operate like that. If your neighbor looks different, if he prays differently, if she speaks a different language, you won't just wake up one day and start hating this person. This is all triggered and instigated and manipulated by others. And usually what happens is that, that you must have an enabling environment for these tangents to be born. And usually this really depends on the political powers because if there is a deficit in the rule of law, in democracy or in good governance, if you have an unequal competition for resources, for power, for land, for positions. This is when communities now start measuring each other against the others. And this is when they, when they feel that there is bias by the decision makers um, along ethnic or religious or national or any other lines. This is when these tensions arise. It's not just that they happen one day, but it's because there are powers who are responsible for making people feel that one is more and one is less. One is superior, one is inferior. And I remember my experience in going to Nigeria many years ago and going to Northern Nigeria in Kaduna, for example, and seeing that the Muslims and the Christians all live together in one place as one community, absolutely no issues. And then I went back a few years ago as a special reporter on a mission and I was told that the situation is completely different in Kaduna and I wanted to go and see. And I did my readings and my preparations before and all the reports I found was, well, you know, the Catholics and, and the Christians and the Muslims just don't get along and you know, this is what it is. And for me, I knew there must be more than this. So when I arrived and when I started conducting the interviews and talking to people, this is when it became clear that this all started because of climate change. All what happened is that the Muslims who were herders had to come more and more south with their cows. And the Christians who owned the land 
were more and more disturbed by the passing cows because it, of course, it uh, in, uh, impacted their um, the way they could um, cultivate their uh, their lands, and so it was clearly an a climate change issue, which was not dealt with the powers that time. And so it became, you know, a problem between those who have the cows and those who have the lands, and they happen to belong to different religious groups. But this has somehow all been disappearing in the narratives. And all the reports were about, you know, these people hate each other. So you really have to go and, and understand what's going on. And as I said, often it's actually really in the hands of these political powers that they fail to find solutions in time. And then it escalates to a level and start, people start pointing at each other, even if they had no issues living together before with each other. So those neighbors who were cooperating, sending their kids to the school together now live in separate Christian and Muslim neighborhoods. They even have like neighborhood watchers, you know, all these patrols who are looking at their properties because they are so afraid of the other. And so I think you must be very careful when we just accept narratives about people's hatred and bias because it never gets born out of people's own initiative. It, there is always something behind and we really must do our best to dig the stories and get the full picture. Otherwise we will be completely misled. Mm, that's very, very interesting. I'm wondering, um... Since you since you mentioned climate change as a factor in in the Nigeria context, obviously there are a lot of different triggers around the world, but um, climate change is appearing to be a bigger factor in a lot of the situations we follow at the Global Center, um, including Nigeria as well as um, more recently the Sahel. Um, since since we can't kind of abruptly um, address the climate change issue <laughs> in a way that will um, necessarily very quickly slow these trends. Um, what do you think leaders can do to, to slow the effects of climate change on the dynamics between communities? Is there a way that we can either um, kind of attempt to solve, not solve, but kind of address the the potential triggers between communities before climate change really has that depth of impact on the population or um, in the case of, of places like Kaduna, um, what can be done to sort of reverse the trend once those tensions have been created? Uh, I must admit I am not a climate change expert. I wish I knew more about this, but if I can react to your question from a different angle and saying that I think that one of the secret lies in making sure that all these voices are heard in time. Because I think in many countries, the problem is, and you mentioned climate change, but we could, we could mention a lot of other um, societal challenges and inequalities. I think one of the main problems is that these voices are not heard and not heard in time. And if you look at government structures in so many places, they completely lack the voices of minority communities, and usually those who are more vulnerable than the others. And I must say here that I'm very critical of our own UN institutions because they are the same. And when I traveled around all these countries, I was shocked how I was trying to find contacts in the community and both the government and sometimes our UN colleagues had absolutely no idea how to connect me with these people. And so my question is, how do we want to prevent atrocities if you don't have that channeling back the information in time? So the problem I think lies in the lack of representation of communities affected by these challenges and problems. Because imagine a climate change situation like what you said. If there is a body, an institution, a structure, a mechanism, that is supposed to gather the voices of communities, then you could go and report and say, look, I have an issue. Like I wanna come through this field, there is no field available or on the other side, like, you know, all these people are coming with the herd and their cows and they are destroying my corp, what can I do? The problem is that there are no institutional establishments that in many, many, many places that would be dedicated to look into these intercommunal issues and tensions.
And so what I recommend many times during my country visits is to ensure that you have channels of communication with the different communities. So you have a trust going on. You have this exchange sharing going on so you know in time you know what is happening and what you can expect so imagine if there is a community which knows that they will be evicted or they are about to be evicted by a municipality if they could go straight to the government and say this is what about this is this will happen to me please do something the government could work out something with the municipality and you could you know maybe minimize the the, the damage but many of these communities are completely lost. And I am bringing up this example because it was really in my case. I went to Cameroon in a small town where a pastoralist uh, Bororo community was about to be evicted. And that time I listened to them, but I had to leave Cameroon and of course go back to my home. And two months later, I received a phone call from somebody who works with this community. And they said, you know, their houses are completely ruined and then they destroy their livelihood and these people are lost and they don't know what to do. Can you do something? And I said, okay, let me write a letter to the government and just see what we can do. So we followed up on the case and we wrote to the government, we wrote to the, to the, to the stakeholders who were involved and they could move back to their land and they could get back to their property. So all they needed was an international attention, somebody who is there to support them. So imagine if there were government institutions that are bringing in these voices, many, many of these atrocities could be prevented in time. So I think there is a big question about the structures and the representation of communities. And I think this could be a, a key point in trying to prevent atrocities to happen. That's very, um, very interesting. And um, I'm just wondering if you could, um, from your experience, elaborate a little bit more on um, kind of the difference between these situations where you see minority rights violated, you see tensions between communities or just sort of uh, widespread bias or racism, whether it be within the community or, or within the government, and um, situations where that kind of escalates to the atrocity level, because it's not always the case, you know, in, in many places, racism exists, um, you know, for long periods of time without ever triggering atrocities. So um, have you noticed any trends where um, there's sort of clear things that kind of come together in a perfect storm that, that escalate atrocities or, or if there are other factors at play? I, I think my, my answer might sound trivial, but I think it comes back to leadership, making it clear that everybody is equal and everybody belongs and everybody has the same dignity in a society. I think that the most fragile societies I have seen were um, at, the, at the brink of falling apart because there were communities who were completely left out and there was no efforts to include them into the national psyche. And so I think it comes back to the question about um, who feels belonging and whether the leadership and especially political powers make clear to everybody that these are our people. It doesn't matter whether they are poor, it doesn't matter whether they have a different religion or language, they are darker or lighter or whatever, but they are our own people. And I think you can measure it, and I try to measure it during my travels by asking the questions of the communities, whether they are proud to be the citizen of this country and how they identify themselves. Because, and I used to use this example, there are countries where I traveled, for example, Malaysia, where you have the Indians, the Malays, um, the Chinese, and other communities. But if you ask them, are you proud to be a Malaysian? They will say, yes, I am. But of course, I am also belonging to this community. We have our specialties, we have this culture, we have this language. But if you go to some other countries, and I used to bring up the courts in Iraq, for example, it's a completely different story. Like when I was in Iraq, in the Kurdistan region, they did not even want to flag to fly the, the Iraqi flag 
because they said, you know, we are so different and we don't really belong and we want to be independent. So these are the signs when people identify not as a citizen of a country, but based on other identities. And very often you can measure it by asking people, so how do you feel? And if they feel like, you know, I am this and this ethnic person, but I know that I'm not a welcome citizen of this country, you know that there is a problem. And so it comes back to this political will of making sure that everybody has the right to equality, but also to equal dignity. And this is a big issue because it comes back to education, to media, to self-representation, to national curriculums. What do you teach about communities? What do you teach about belongings? Whether you acknowledge that all these different communities contributed to the culture of a society, or whether you deny it, or whether you even twist the facts and you change history and you just create these scapegoats. So I think it really comes back to the main messages coming from the leaders about we are all one, no matter what. Because then people feel like, ah, okay, we have differences, but we are one. Like in a family, you know, you can have some members in your family who are completely different, but it's a family. You would accept them, you would talk to them, you would work out issues. Even if you have tangents, you would still sit at the same dinner table, throw your frustration, but you would try to work it out. But if you don't feel that this is a family, you know, you just turn your back and then you leave. And then this is when I think it's too late to try to, to bring people together. That's excellent. Um... I think you've you've hinted at this a little bit through talking about what governments need to do to um, sort of improve that cohesion between communities and and sort of improve that inclusive feeling. But um, I think one of the interesting things about being a special rapporteur is that you don't just visit countries that are in crisis. You also sort of visit. Um, tons of countries throughout the world. And so, and so I'm wondering if, whether they be countries that had a crisis that needed to be addressed or, or just um, any state in general, have you seen sort of best practices or um, particular examples that stood out as, as really good policies that governments have pursued to protect, protect minority rights or decrease um, racism and discrimination? It's interesting, I, I, I should think about it in terms of, of practicalities and what causes that, but I must say that the very country that I am in now, Senegal, is a very good example. People don't talk about it much, they didn't have a, a crisis, but there is a 5% Christianity and a 95% of Islam, and there has never been any interreligious issues here. And I believe that it's because all the Christian holidays are held with the same respect as Islamic holidays. You know, my, when my kids go to the school, they have a, a, a holiday almost every two weeks because we celebrate every Islamic holiday, every Christian um, holiday, and then all the international ones and then the Senegalese one. And I think like you have countries like this, which are not in the, somehow in the light because they are just doing so well and they are so peaceful. And I wish that we had more conversations about this type of countries where, you know, everybody talks, especially in the Western world about like Islam just being so aggressive and, you know, like you can't exist as a Christian person in a Muslim country because they will try to change you by force. And, and you know, you have so many prejudices and then I'm sitting here, I'm saying like, I'm saying, hello, you know, I'm trying to like write in my comments into the social media post and saying like, open your eyes. There are so many countries in this world which operate well, but we don't talk about them because they are silent, silent. And exactly because they are so peaceful, you know, don't have all this news about, you know, like tangents and conflicts and war and whatever, because they are doing so well. And I hope that in the future, we can somehow highlight all these countries, which despite, you know, some, some challenges like any other countries are really doing well and they are resistant and they are so, are resilient and even here of course there is always an attempt by some islamists you know to try to bring um, destroy the peace but everybody everybody rejects it and it's like no no we have never had these interreligious conflicts 
uh, Senegal had a Christian president at the very beginning. So, you know, like you have countries like this. And of course, also, if you think about like places like Switzerland with having all the languages and then the territorial arrangements with the languages and, you know, they have, they have no issues. So I think that we should really try to probably have more research about what are the factors in these countries which ensure that they are peaceful and despite the challenges that exist everywhere, they are still so coherent and, and so stable and they are not even at any point of, of history in a danger to fall apart or you know, going into civil war. And so I think we need to believe that there are these places and it's possible, but of course it's the news which is always interested in, in, the, in the negatives. And I hope that we, we can counterbalance this somehow in the future. I think we have a big responsibility in, in doing that. Yeah, I think uh, you're right that the news tends to focus on the drama as opposed to the mm -hmm. heartwarming stories. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Senegal and, um, and your experience there because I think there are some very positive examples in the West Africa region. Um, you know, Ghana is another one where they've had conflicts, but they have this National Peace Council that where they've been a bit meticulous about making sure that every single religious and ethnic group is represented on the council. And, um, and it's done a lot to kind of prevent um, similar conflicts from, from coming up again. So um, there's definitely a lot of, of positive success stories to celebrate in that region. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if, if there are any particular examples where you felt um, your role was extra important. You were very useful in, in addressing a situation in a country, either a special rapporteur or um, in your new role with the treaty body? I, I think, again, it comes back to the simple things about just keeping an eye on communities who would not be taken seriously. And, you know, it sounds so little, but I think that every time I travel to a place and I manage to make that connection with people who felt like the UN is present, you know, like some of these hidden communities, the pygmies, or, you know, when I go to rural areas, um, for them, the United Nations is something which is like in a very far place, you know, like a fortress, something absolutely unreachable and unapproachable. Um, and then when you go and they see you and you are a face of the institution, even if an independent one, it makes people feel like they are important. And you know, when they share your views with you, their, their views with you, and then you take it down and then you put it in a report, I think it can really give them that boost that they matter. So just to listen to people can sometimes really empower them because they can feel like, okay, what I say is actually important. And I also felt that the UN has an extremely important convening power, which we have to utilize more in the future. I remember when I was in Sri Lanka, for example, and I brought together a meeting with all the minorities, the Roma, the Afro-descendants, the indigenous peoples. Um, there were really all kinds of uh, communities that never met before. And then you looked around this group of people who could have been in any country because they were so diverse. And they told me like, you know, we never came together. They never knew that our concern is shared by others. Because for example, mother tongue education was shared by every single participant who came to that, that meeting. And I believe that sometimes what the UN needs to do is just to create that space for people to come together and to realize that they are bound by common interests and common challenges. Because I think by them, you can have them, you know, joining their forces and I often believe that once I leave a country, then I leave this community stronger because now they know each other, they know the connections and they know me. So they know that if and if I leave the country, I leave my email address and they can connect me. And as I just said in this example of Cameroon, they use it. So sometimes if they are in trouble, they, connect, they contact me. And so I think that of course the UN does a lot of big things and like preventing all these conflicts or the peace building, the, the peacekeeping missions, the vaccinations of children, feeding them. 
and we should keep this in mind, but I think it's, sometimes it's in a very little thing so of, of just empowering communities by your presence and by the connection um, and by making them really believe that they matter because sometimes governments don't project that idea and that approach. And I think that the UN must do that because then they will have more courage to go to the government and seek an appointment and talk about their own problems because they will say, hey, I told this to the UN as well. And they, they were very supportive. So now you have to listen to me as well. So I'm also hoping that we can have them, you know, also in, in the national level to have a better collaboration with, with the power brokers in, in the society. That's, not, that's excellent. Um, I have one, one sort of closing question for you that mm -hmm. builds on, on that idea. Um, I think since you've had experience um, as an insider within the UN, as well as someone working with civil society and um, Roma communities, and also just your interaction with civil society within countries, um, is there anything that sort of ordinary citizens or, or civil society groups who aren't necessarily, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the wealthy, powerful ones that, that can gain access to the UN um, on a more regular basis than when the special rapporteurs uh, or others visit countries? Uh, is there anything they can do to um, strengthen social cohesion or, or bring attention to the issues that put them most at risk? um to i guess bring it to the attention of the power brokers as you mentioned or just to even local powerful leaders that could possibly address the risks i think that in my experience in this past 20 years the biggest problem i ident i identified was the silence of the majority it's the inactivity and the sometimes the indifference of people who are not directly affected by discrimination, by racism, by conflict, by atrocities. And when I grew up, as, and as a Roma person, I heard about the Holocaust, for example. You know, I could not imagine how it happened. As a child, I could not believe that people would just watch that thousands are being killed. And because that was the reality of my ancestors, right? And I was, I, I, I just rejected this whole idea. I said like, this is not possible that people will watch. And then I must say that I grew up and I started seeing, for example, the narratives around migration and how all these many governments in power started talking about migrants as they are just, human beings without any value, and how so many people started keeping quiet instead of saying that, you know, we have to stand up for these people. Like some of them really come from war-torn countries and societies and they need protection. But so many people were quiet. And I could unfortunately gradually see how the Holocaust, for example, happened or any mass atrocities happened. Because the issue is that a lot of people are uncomfortable to take up uneasy conversations. And especially now in the age of social media, I know a lot of people who watch this news, very disturbing narratives about you know, minorities, indigenous peoples, migrants, refugees, poor people in general, um, and all those who just don't have of poverty in society. And they disagree with the content of what they read, but they are just tired of arguing. So they read an article, they shake their head, and they don't do anything. Because they say like, you know, what's the point in getting into a fight with these extreme rightists, with the hate mongers, with all those who are citing, you know, all this racism on the internet. And, and so people keep quiet and they close their laptops and they are disturbed, but they don't take a stand. And this is why it has been really my, my cross that I have carried for a few years now to convince people to get into the debate. And I always tell people, your goal is not to convince the hate mongers that they are wrong because they have an interest, they have an agenda 
they know what they are doing. They do it for a purpose. They do it to gain economic or financial or political power. Like that's, that's clear. But you have to take up the fight because you want to show other people that they are not alone with their opinions. So if there is a hate monger who, who writes a horrible article, you have to put your rejection, not because you want to change the persons you who wrote the article, but because you want to see, you want to make sure that all the people who come to that same website and read the comments can see yours and can say like, oh, okay, thank God, there are other people who reject this idea, who think like me, who love peace, who believe in coexistence and, and love between people. And I really think that this is the fight we have to fight in the 21st century, especially with the COVID-19 and all the online digital world, that we have to be more outspoken. We have to be more like anti-racist and anti, you know, hatred people, because we need to build that critical mass and we need to encourage our, each other that we are more, because I believe that we are more. I never doubted that you know, those of us who believe in peace and love, we are more than those who are interested in triggering hatred. But the problem is we are quiet. So we give a false impression that we are not there. And so I think what we need to do, all of us, and this is really my message to everybody, especially young people, that just take up the fight and don't be tired because your goal is not to change the mindset of those few crazy people. Your goal is to show others that we are more and we really can build this critical mass to fight against all this, this hatred and negative energies and the bias that is around us. Because I think this is really how we can survive as a humanity, but we need to support each other. And if you see the first signs of somebody being targeted and violated and harassed and abused, we immediately have to stop it. And so when others say, see that you are there um, raising your voice, they will be encouraged to raise their voice as well. And then we can you know, really bear that movement against all the people who mean bad and, 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 um, and yeah, who just want to destroy whatever we have built during this, these last centuries. And uh, not centuries, but I think decades of peace now. <laughs> Thank you for that really powerful <laughs> reflection mm -hmm. and call to action. Um, I think you really sort of hit right on the nose um, something that those of us in, in the atrocity prevention community find both very frustrating, but also is, is much of our motivation for, for being in this field, for doing this mm -hmm. work. Um, and hopefully through our advocacy and, and everything we're working on, everything you're working on, we can inspire others to um, take that charge as well. Um, so thank you for joining us today. This was a really um, insightful interview and we really appreciate hearing your, your thoughts as well as your life experiences. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from hearing your stories over the past hour. Thank you, Jacqueline. I also appreciate um, this opportunity and uh, I wish you all the best to the center. I think what you do is very essential. I hope you can continue your work raising awareness and, and yeah, we are fighting for the same cause. We are in the same boat. So I hope you will continue uh, your work with the same strength and encouragement despite all the difficulties that we encounter these days. Thank you.